Just as we exemplified the concept of ecological functions with prairies and ecological transitions in savannas, these floodplain woodlands are an easy representation of what we'll try to exemplify in all woodlands. I've already said the term, so hopefully you're already confused. I mean, of course, nutrient cycling. When the tree falls, though, that is the real important part, the part of her journey that will benefit this land and thus perhaps you and me for millennia to come. Behold, the rotting log, and lo, the downwood. Have you beheld it yet? Okay, right, anyway. Well, first of all, a whole new community of life takes over, right? So we have some new kinds of fungus, like false turkey tails and wolf farts. Yeah, that's what they're called. And also a number of invertebrates and whatnot, like millipedes. They help begin the lengthy process of mineralizing all of this stuff into stuff that you and me, perhaps, will be able to use someday. Hell, logs are great shelter too. I mean, look at that. I'd live there, but it's already occupied by mice and minks, chipmunks, toads, turtles, snakes, and all kinds of whatnot. As a log or a stump, a dead tree might even become a nursery to other plants that are growing there. It's isolated from the ground, it's immune to erosion, and it has a fresh and replenishing supply of nutrients and fertilizer and friends right in the substrate. This phenomena in particular is especially common in the Cascades region where trees like firs and hemlocks and such will frequently be seen growing out of the stumps of their dead relatives. It's like if we used human skeletons as baby cradles. Okay, so what does this mean to you and everything else for the next many thousands of years? Well, first of all, wood practically makes the soil here. It is deep, deep within it, and it leaves a signature. Practically anywhere you go, you can tell what kind of trees grew in an area throughout different points in history by taking a soil core sample. Now, while it's dead plants, roots, and poop that primarily make up the prairie topsoil, or humus, it's mostly wood and poop that make up the woodland humus. And all of that wood continues to serve a function for a very long time. As it gets pushed deeper and deeper into the soil, it acts sort of like one of those time release capsules that they put meds in over the course of centuries. The wood is pushed deeper, and the whole way down, it's releasing new nutrients into the surrounding environment. But it ain't doing that just by itself, no. Once the tree is on the ground, it's time for all of those microbes that the critters brought to the tree, and all of those microbes freestanding in the soil to make of that wood the stuff which all life on Earth needs. The stuff that fertilizes our food crops, that can grow trees in the first place, the stuff that builds the proteins that make all this stuff. I'm talking, of course, about nitrogen. Whereas in prairies, nitrogen-fixing bacteria tend to associate with certain plants in those crazy root masses that make up the humus, in woodlands, those nitrogen-fixing bacteria are just kind of around. When the tree falls, the bacteria around and those introduced by all the critters start to break down the nitrogenous compounds, draw it out, and spread it to the surrounding environment to be enriched. Then, as the tree continues to descend into the soil, fungi will decompose it such that it will eventually contain more nitrogenous compounds than ever before. This means the bacteria return to stay, and that explains the time-release nature of a rotting tree's nutrient cycling. And it also explains why dead and rotting logs and stumps can be like nurseries for other plants. But it's not all about the trunk of the tree. While a decaying log is a city of life, the majority of the soil, the humus, and the majority of the organisms that inhabit it just live in fallen twigs and branches and leaves. Say, speaking of leaves, remember that whole carbon sequestration thing that grasslands and wetlands do really well? Woodlands do a wonderful job of that too. The only reason it's not considered as efficient is because it takes longer. 
The tree grows and parts of it die every year, but the vast majority of the carbon it takes up, which makes up half of its dry mass, is locked away in there until the tree straight up dies. But the leaves, oh yeah, the leaves again. It hardly matters what kind of tree it is. As long as it sheds in autumn, it is storing pounds of carbon every single year in every square foot of soil all around it. All trees do this to some degree, but our native oak, hickory, maple woodlands are the most potent combo available to us in the Midwest. For each of these species, a tree just 20 inches in diameter, not very big, can store 2,000 pounds of carbon inside of it. But this combo of trees is being lost rapidly to shorter lived, less functional woodland communities. Deer browsing is a big part of that. With all their apex predators gone and their picky diets browsing away the more valuable plants, at this point we kind of just need hunters to do the work for us. That's why they're so important. And it's much better meat than you'll buy in a grocery store. Invasions of plants occur for a variety of reasons too. And some of them are really hard to curtail, like grapevines, which can swallow up entire patches of trees, uh, largely because of the increase in heat and carbon dioxide, which they love. And gee, what does climate change mainly change? Heat and carbon dioxide levels. Invasive plants of all kinds are ravaging forests for a variety of reasons, and invasive birds, fungi, and insects and whatnot too. Some are like plagues to specific trees or species, wiping out entire populations before our eyes. Some are only here and thriving because, well, pop quiz. What is the marital partner of oak trees as I described earlier? Natural disturbance. And what have humans suppressed at every opportunity? You guessed it. And of course, here we're severely lacking the primary natural disturbance regime of our region, of course, the low intensity wildfire. Now, when it comes to fire, oaks, they do it best and their leaves are no exception. Not only do they make their own fire fuel, but they've got other purposes too. You see, just as the oak trees are creating a whole disparate world beyond our perception above our heads, so too are their leaves doing out of our perception beneath our feet. Not only are oak leaves the ideal, the sturdiest, the strongest, the warmest nesting material for countless species of every kingdom of life, but they are also the ideal habitat for a great variety of, you guessed it, microbes and fungi. And I'm not stopping. No, we're going to keep talking about dead leaves until you appreciate them, because these oaks, these oaks, oh, these oaks. They ain't just creating whole entire worlds above your head and under your feet, but underwater too. You see, the kind of leaves that fall to the bottom of the pond can determine a lot of the things that can live there. And oak leaves, even underwater, remain the sturdiest nesting material for countless species and their nurseries. Not plant nurseries, no, but insect and fish and amphibian nurseries, using the strong, sturdy leaves to lay clutches of their eggs. Then we've got salamanders, turtles, and frogs, which need the warm oak leaves to insulate them during hibernation. And because all that debris is locked up underwater, in woodland ponds much more so than prairie ponds because they're more permanent, all of that debris, all of those excess nutrients in the leaves aren't going anywhere for a long time, especially carbon. Because at the bottom of the pond, there are bunch of organisms that are breaking down the leaves, releasing the carbon dioxide, which floats towards the surface of the water where phytoplankton and other microorganisms are turning the carbon dioxide into oxygen. So oaks affect everything in the woodlands. How does that affect you in town? Well, it already has, not just in scientific ways. Besides the fact that oak trees and their constituents have likely made up many of the compounds that make up you, they are also one of the most culturally significant species in the entire world. Remember in the first video when I mentioned all that crap about all cultures in the world at some point being founded on the same dependency on nature? Well, many of those cultures didn't forget that, and oak trees were essential to that. They didn't know what mycelium was, they didn't know what photosynthesis was, but they knew in some way that these were intelligent, they were sensitive. Tolkien knew that and exemplified it in his universe 
with all trees through the ends. And he didn't understand what mycorrhizal processes were, but was able to show them through his characters because of how many cultures in Europe had already been dependent on these trees for their whole existence. So, almost every culture in Europe was dependent on these trees and their ecosystems for food, for shelter, for gathering places, for religion, for spirituality, for magic, whatever they called it. Thus, oak trees have become one of the most revered symbols in cultures in Europe and across the world. The Amerindians knew it best. They figured, well, you know, oaks are in charge. Whatever is best for them is best for me. And thus, they helped in cre the creation of one of the temperate world's most diverse and functional series of ecosystems. Oaks were important too in China, in the Levant, in many Arab nations, and in upper Indian nations, and so on and so forth. But did they just... But did they just have weddings and make sacrifices under oak trees? No. Of course not. There's, there's, there's plenty of uses for oak trees. Yeah, people eat acorns. So what? But also... Oaks make some of the most ideal lumber in the world. It's very strong, very dense, flexible, and rot resistant, among other things. And throughout human history, it has been and remains one of the world's most important raw materials. In fact, most of the woods on this continent that we still have are managed for lumber. It's about 741 million acres in the United States alone, or 7.5% of all the world's woodlands. Most of those that are owned by the government are already managed for lumber. But about 56% is privately owned, and about 35% from that is individuals and families, as opposed to companies or nonprofits. However, it's become increasingly obvious to foresters worldwide that if you want the best, biggest lumber trees in the longest lasting soil in which to grow them, you need pristine woodlands. So, we should fell all our pristine woodlands before climate change and invasive species do it for us. No. What that means is that if we want the most bang for our buck, a clean, productive source of high-quality lumber that also stores carbon, cleans air and water, and recycles life's essential nutrients. We need to manage our lumber woods ecologically. All the different kinds of lumber our society needs can be sustainably harvested if we apply the right methods of harvesting to the right ecosystem. Just like I said earlier, oak trees are married to natural disturbance. And so are many other kinds of trees with other kinds of natural disturbance. When humans replace natural disturbance regimes with artificial ones, timber harvesting provides an answer to both the ecosystem's needs and our own. Fortunately, sustainable timber harvesting is becoming pretty much normal among qualified foresters across the world. However, the biggest hurdle to get over is perhaps going to be those private landowners who own a majority of the woodlands in our country. Only about 20% of those private landowners have received any sort of counsel whatsoever on managing their woodland ecosystems. It's not just their responsibility though, it's yours. It's everyone's responsibility to the rest of the world and innumerable other species that share it with us to ensure that we support the healthiest, most sustainable methods of forestry according to the privileges that our society has afforded us to support whatever means of forestry we choose. No matter if you live in a desert or on a boat or whatever, you're still dependent on forestry and the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> the little film. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> no. And no matter if you live in a desert or on a boat, you're still dependent on forestry. Simply trying to ensure that you don't buy foods that were produced by destroying woodlands to make room for them, or that you buy paper products that don't use trees at all, are great ways to start. Or you can also positively affect your local environments by just distributing some of the native plant seeds as you walk around the woods, or picking up some litter on your way out, or you can volunteer with your local forest preserves, eh? eh? But you don't even have to leave the home. 
you can also just ensure that you don't plant anything in your garden that could become invasive to your local environment if the seeds are spread by bird poop or wind. Plant native and eat venison. Hunters get a bad rap, but they can actually be some of our greatest allies in ecological stewardship. Just as we've replaced natural disturbance with ourselves, we too must replace apex predators with ourselves when they can't be brought back, thus awarding our society a clean, lean, and naturally raised source of meat. Not only by having hunters and recreationalists pay for their use of our natural resources can we have them fund the management of those natural resources, with a little bit of taxpayer assistance we can also make ecological stewardship a normal public works job, available to people of a wide variety of skill sets or none at all, thus creating countless jobs in the process. And on top of that, we can actually use forests to simultaneously grow an abundance of different kinds of foods without hurting their ecological value. But I'm getting ahead of myself here and into the next video. Where I'm going with this is it's going to be a team effort. For every environment, for every person of every background and every income, we all need to take responsibility. Are dying and novel ecosystems your fault? No, not exactly. You don't run a concentrated animal feed operation or a chemical manufacturing plant, hopefully. But this is your world as much as anyone else's. And if you want a better one, well, the folks running the CAFOs and the chemical plants have just the world they want. But we don't care what they want. We care about healthy environments and healthy bodies, minds, communities, relationships. And we risk all of that unless all of us do our part. What does that mean? Well, that's what I want to explain in the next video. How do we all do our part? Is it hard? No, not actually, uh, if we all do a little bit. But the hardest part about it is not changing the environment. It's changing our mindsets. For now though, ruminate on these last few episodes on the interconnectivity we've so discussed in preparation for a lesson on stewardship, how every single one of us can be an ecological steward. Until then, just remember to take care of yourselves and your planet, because this planet lives and dies with us. But also, it's wood.